Okay, so next up we have Eric Zielinski, and Eric leads the cloud delivery organization at Nationwide, where he's worked for over 15 years. He uh, is responsible for a large portfolio of products, including uh, work on cloud platforms, security automation, and self-service adoption, as well as DevOps and DevSecOps transformations. Uh, he's got a couple different GX certifications, including an NCASE forensic certification. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Eric. Good afternoon. Thank you, Kenneth. I appreciate that. I'm just trying to get set up here and uh, make sure that I've got uh, my slides up and running. So just give me one second. Do you have my slides up, Kenneth, or I might have to pull them up? No, uh, one of our uh, moderators should be able to handle that. Um, Eric, you should have screen control. So if you click into the screen, you should be, and then you just, yep, there you go. Uh, I got it. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Yeah, so uh, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Eric Zielinski. Uh, I'm with uh, Nationwide uh, Fortune 100 company. I've been in information security for over 20 years. I've done everything from the early days of attack and penetration testing uh, to spending about eight years in forensics and incident response. Uh, I've set up our threat intel uh, team and our cyber fusion center that includes our, our SOC. Uh, and uh, I'm now taking on a new challenge over the past couple of years of leading our, our cloud And as I click on the screen, I'm not able to advance my slide. But there we go. OK. Um, as we think about vulnerability management, uh, just in general, um, I love this picture because I feel that it kind of represents my feelings on what vulnerability management is like. Um, it's kind of like looking up at the sky and seeing millions of stars and uh, galaxies and solar systems and just thinking about just how big it is and um, how much scale there is uh, to it. And uh, so anyways, uh, moving into why I like this picture, it's kind of the same and similar to when we think about vulnerability management. We think about things like all the assets that we have to manage, um, all of the vulnerabilities that are out there. How do we classify those vulnerabilities? How do we remediate those vulnerabilities? How do we detect those vulnerabilities? How do we report on it? Um, so um, it's just a great example, just of kind of the scale of when we talk about uh, vulnerability management. Um, today, I'm gonna dive into uh, a few different topics and talk through what Nationwide's cloud journey was like, um, what we've actually, uh, accomplished over the past couple of years, how we went to cloud, talk a little bit about the cloud vulnerability management life cycle. Um, this, these terms called pets and cattle that tend to come up whenever we talk vulnerabilities in the cloud, talk a little bit about how we handle zero days in the cloud, and then uh, end with um, just some basic cloud native tooling and some ideas and focus around automation. So our cloud journey actually began back in 2018. Um, so we started um, building one cloud platform that we wanted to get really good at. And so we really focused on uh, putting all of the security guardrails, measuring against all types of compliance benchmarks uh, before we kind of opened up for production and hosted any applications into the cloud. We've always had a multi-vendor cloud strategy. We didn't want to just be stuck with one cloud provider. Um, and so, but we did want to take the approach of building one out first and making sure that that was, um, you know, 100% ready. And so if you're, if you're starting your cloud journey, one thing to think about is, um, is that approach, right? I've seen a lot of companies try and build out multiple ones and um, trying to scale out all the security controls on there can be a challenge at times. 
as we built our cloud platforms, we wanted to enable self-service. And what this meant was that anybody that wanted to go to cloud could go to cloud. And so we made it pretty easy for them to get their account set up. We gave them uh, training videos. We talked to them how we do cloud, how we customize cloud, how it's architected, um, what you should expect whenever you go to cloud because we really just wanted to get as many applications in there as we possibly could. Um, our approach was to migrate existing applications and also focus on new build applications. Um, we wanted a heavy focus on speed of adoption. Uh, again, looking at what are the uh, simple apps that we could quickly move into the cloud, we could decom them in our data center and actually save uh, on some financials. Uh, there's a lot of benefits there around cost optimization that we were trying to leverage. We also were attempting to embrace DevOps, uh, this philosophy of an application team that would build it and run it and then also secure their application end to end. We had a no pets allowed mentality. Everything was supposed to be CI CD. I'll talk a little bit more uh, a little bit later about what pets are. Um, but what we really wanted to do was just ensure that all the apps that were going there were embracing DevOps and they were um, deploying uh, continuously deploying on a regular basis so that we could gain benefits of like rapid series innovation. Um, we were also building security uh, into the background, right? And making this embedded and seamless. So application teams, so we wouldn't really get in the way of application teams. Yet, whenever they're moving data or they're moving their apps to the cloud, it was secure. Uh, and then automate as many processes as we can. This was all part of our digital transformation effort. And uh, you know, cloud was one piece of it. Dev DevOps was another piece of it. Uh, we wanted to modernize our applications. We have a lot of legacy monolithic applications that are, are rather large and would be difficult to lift and shift to the cloud or would just be more costly uh, in the long run. Uh, but this did require folks to have new roles and new responsibilities. Uh, so we had to, you know, continuously teach and uh, application teams had to continuously learn um, new ways of actually deploying and developing their application in the cloud. So those were our initial expectations. Um, and the reality was uh, change is hard. Um, application teams uh, resisted moving to the cloud at first. They had difficulty learning some of the new skills, understanding what the true value of cloud was. Um, they were very comfortable with the way that they've always done things. Change meant actually being uncomfortable. And so what we had to do was really convince them of the benefits of why we should be going to cloud. And so we were evangelizing cloud um, throughout the company. And uh, I love this quote by Gandhi that says, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. And so there's a lot of truth to that. Whenever we talk about the cloud, we really needed to find those early adopters, um, the application teams that were uh, more on the cutting edge of using emerging technology, not afraid to experiment, not afraid to innovate, um, and find those adopters and bring those along uh, as part of the, the very first people to move to cloud. And we were successful in that. Um, and then we started to gain a momentum um, bit by bit, right? It didn't happen overnight. A lot of the, the growth that we initially expected um, wasn't occurring. We moved maybe one application, you know, over the first couple months. And then we got up to three applications over three months. And, you know, we were hoping to get, you know, over a hundred applications at least by the end of the year, once we've opened our platforms. Um, and so the growth started slow, but as people started to learn and as people started to experiment, um, we had to create um, very various mechanisms um, to enable application teams to actually get to the cloud. And uh, some of those mechanisms that we created were cloud migration parties. And these were a three-day session where we brought in subject matter experts into a room. And these subject matter experts were people from architecture, they were engineers, they were developers. They were security engineers, um, they were uh, SREs, and uh, basically it was a launch pad for applications getting into the cloud. So we basically held their hand and um, got them started, helped answer their questions, removed blockers. Uh, we got a lot of things done in those cloud migration parties. And the first one was so successful, successful that we started to 
host them every single month and have different app teams come along. And um, another mechanism we used was a dojo concept. And the dojo concept is, is pretty cool because um, you can embed with an application team for about four to six weeks. And um, you just uh, all work together on moving your application to cloud. A lot of questions came up from application teams around support or security. Um, and so we needed a support mechanism. And so we created cloud clinics, which were um, open every Monday from like four, like uh, two to five p.m., um, where anybody could stop in, and we'd have cloud experts, security experts in there answering all types of questions as they, um, as they're on their journey. So overall, um, we were we were more successful than we thought. Um, we had over three hundred and eighteen applications that started on their cloud journey. We had sixty eight new builds. Um, so these are new applications that. Um, built in the cloud. And then we had 101 applications that we migrated from our on-prem data centers into the cloud in just one year. Uh, and that's completely decommissioning the hardware and uh, fully operation operationalizing in the cloud. Um, so that was exciting, but we did learn a lot along that way. Uh, we learned that not all applications can reach or need full CI CD pipelines. Uh, there's a lot of third party applications that we leverage where vendors uh, provide a SaaS solution or there's a marketplace image or, um, you know, there's there's various uh, integrations or dependencies that, um, you know, we weren't accounting for and, and how we had to solve those was challenging. Uh, we also learned about container adoption. Uh, containers uh, was an emerging technology uh, that started um, Right whenever we were focused on moving to cloud, we had a lot of folks moving to, um, you know, AWS platform and they're uh, hosting their applications on EC2s. And then we uh, worked with our architecture team and understood that containers offer cheaper compute. And uh, this was the strategic direction forward for the enterprise. And so uh, we had to um, we had to pivot and we had to learn how are we going to handle containers in the cloud. And so it was actually easier for application teams to learn containers than it was for them to, to go typically to AWS. Um, but what that did was it actually generated uh, a lot of pets. Um, we got a lot of innovation out of it, um, but we now have these things called pets that we have to handle. And let me talk a little bit about um, pets and cattle. And um, this is a new term that I coined, I'm calling them ghosts, but let me explain each one. So think about uh, a pet in the cloud as a uh, cloud instance of compute that needs taken care of, very similar to how you would take care of your servers on-prem and how you would uh, provide basic services, support services, um, you would care and feed these services. You'd have maybe an infrastructure team that takes care of these services. And they would do the same for a cloud instance, right? And so um, they wouldn't get a lot of the benefits that you can get from um, speed innovation, uh, fail fast in the cloud um, when you're running a pet. Um, you know, so we have these pets that we now have to patch and then we have to support them and then we have to troubleshoot them. Um, and application teams just want their application to run and they want the infrastructure to run, but they don't want to care about it. Then we have these things called cattle, which is really our aspirational state of cloud. And this is where you've got, you know, a fleet of servers that you really don't care about. You can spin it up and you can spin it down and it doesn't impact. There's no outages. Um, you get a lot of benefits when it comes to vulnerability management, and I'll explain a little bit about how you can get those benefits, um, but you really don't have to worry about patching when it comes to cattle uh, like you would with pets uh, from an infrastructure standpoint. Now, there are some caveats there whenever we talk about containers, and I'll dive a little bit deeper into that uh, as the presentation goes along. Um, and then we also have these other things that I kind of coined this term called ghosts, um, which are basically cloud instances that existed once and um, they don't exist anymore, but they may reappear a couple weeks from now or a couple months from now um, as a different instance. Or maybe there are instances that are running and nobody knows that they exist. Uh, one of the things that I'd be cautious about you operate in a cloud environment is to have uh, 
a handle on all the assets that are running in cloud. You want to right size your instances so that you're only paying for what you need. And if you have instances that are running and nobody knows that they exist, you're paying for things that you likely don't need. And so i um, going to dive a little bit into the vulnerability management cycle for cloud to just provide some context. And then we'll continue talking about some of the benefits that you'll get from actually deploying as as cattle uh, from a vulnerability management perspective. So uh, vulnerability management cycle life cycle for cloud is, is very similar to on-prem. There are some subtle differences. You obviously want to prepare and, and have a good handle on asset management. Um, I'm sure a lot of folks struggle with asset management. Uh, I know, you know, a large company like Nationwide, uh, we've struggled with it for years, having a central CMDB and ensuring that you've got all the right um, device information, asset information, asset owners, IP addresses, um, you know, all centralized and all easy to find uh, is easier said than done. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we actually accomplished that in the cloud and, and found it to be a little bit much easier than, than on-prem. Uh, identification, right? So having some sort of detection mechanism of detecting vulnerabilities. So whether you're leveraging a third-party tool or you're leveraging a cloud native service, you want to be able to detect your vulnerabilities, analyze, uh, being able to report on you know your vulnerabilities. How do you know if you're doing well? How do you know um, you know how many vulnerabilities you have? What the criticality of those vulnerabilities are? Are you trending up? Are you trending down? Uh, so being able to have some good reporting, uh, especially when it comes to cattle, you're going to want to change your approach as you. Um, uh, rely on the application team to take more ownership of the security of their applications. Um, they're going to need to see uh, visualizations and they're going to need to understand um, how well their application is doing from a vulnerability perspective. Uh, communication, uh, this is a big one when it comes to um, vulnerability management in the cloud, uh, ensuring that folks are following um, your standard SLA. How are you providing governance to ensure that instances are getting patched? How are you patching pets? How are you ensuring that cattle are being redeployed? Um, what if they're not being redeployed? What do you do? Uh, so communication is really big there. Uh, and then last is about remediation. Um, as I mentioned, pets are traditionally patched using a patch management solution tool, um, similar to how you would patch your servers on-prem. Um, cattle are uh, essentially just redeployed with the latest images. Um, and so just understanding what that process actually looks like. Is, I'll dive into a little bit more of that uh, here in just a minute. Uh, so this is uh, when things are working as they are to be expected. When your cloud vulnerability management practices are operating as expected, um, what we've done is we've created a, and this is for cattle, and what we've done is we've created a golden image process. And what that means is we typically have a Linux engineering team or Windows engineering team uh, build a standard image. You know, it's based off of our enterprise templates. Uh, it's got like secure configurations applied to it. It ensures that it's got um, you know, the, the basics that are required to run our servers on-prem, essentially, um, we make those images available for cloud. Um, but what we've done is we've um, initiated an additional gate by our cloud security engineering team. And so whenever they publish an image before we actually release it to be used by any instance in the cloud, our security engineering team reviews that image for vulnerabilities. So they actually run a vulnerability report and they analyze the vulnerabilities that are found on that image. They look at the security packages that are installed, ensure that they are uh, configured correctly, and then they'll approve or reject the image. Um, if they approve the image, the image is actually released and it's available for application teams to, uh, to use for rehydration or redeployment. Um, you know, you can have whatever standard you want, uh, you know, mandated for your application cattle, how often they should redeploy. Uh, if you say 30 days or you say 60 days or 120 days, it's all based on your organization's policy. Um, but essentially, you know, our expectation is that, that they redeploy their application uh, within 30 days. Um, and then we need to validate that that has occurred and report on um, the ones that have and the ones that haven't. And so this was uh, the original process that we created as we started to see cattle in our environment. And um, this is what we expected to happen. However, um, the reality is it doesn't always happen as expected. Um, so same type of process, our team reviews the golden image, we approve it, we make it available. But then what happens when you have doesn't redeploy? And so they're not going to, um, 
you know, maybe they forgot, maybe um, they thought that they were just patching an application and, you know, they're, they're running DevSecOps uh, and they assume that they're secure, but they're not redeploying their infrastructure, but they think that their application is patched. And so, uh, so they think they're good. Um, so what we have to do is we have to, we have to identify which ones are not actually redeploying. And what we'll do is potentially escalate to them and say, Hey, we see that you're running this instance. It's older than 30 days. You need to redeploy. Um, some teams will get back to us and say, yep, done, taken care of. Sorry about that. Uh, other teams may not respond, right? What happens if they don't respond? Then we'll continue to escalate up the chain um, to the point where uh, we get to questions like, well, if we're not getting any response from their leaders um, or the VPs of the company, um, what should we do? Should, they're still vulnerable and they're putting us at risk. Should we force the patch? So that's an option. Um, we've created a, a blacklist process, which a blacklist process would essentially shut down an instance and prevent it from spinning back up. Um, and it's, it's all automated and, um, until they actually apply the patches. Um, but what happens when that becomes production? Do you really shut down your production instances? Uh, what if it's a you know, revenue generating application, it's making millions of dollars and you've shut it down because it doesn't have vulnerability because it has put the company at risk. Those are hard conversations to have. So you really wanna ensure that you've got the right support from your CISO and from your, um, your leaders of your business units. Um, you know, one approach that we've done is when we start seeing cattle that are not operating as expected, we'll turn them back into pets. And so we're building automation in uh, to check a set of criteria that it must meet in order to become cattle. And if it doesn't, then it automatically tags it and it goes over to our patching team and the patching team will just patch it as a pet. Um, but we really want to ensure that we're educating the right behaviors. And this is key communication, ensuring the app teams understand what they're accountable for doing when it comes to vulnerability management and security in the cloud. Uh, communicate, 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 over communicate as much as you possibly can. Um, we've got a great internal website everybody goes to to learn all about cloud and we've got a security section on there that folks can um, can learn all different types of things um, when it comes to how we do security in the cloud. Um, and then once they've, you know, uh, they meet that criteria again, uh, we can return them to cattle and as long as they're redeploying, we're good. Okay, so 10 things that you should consider about um, cloud vulnerability management. As I mentioned earlier, story of cloud assets, it comes back to the foundations again, right? When we talk about, you know, security controls, um, you know, the critical controls, asset management is number one, and it always will be number one because you really need to understand um, who owns your assets, how many assets you have, where they're located, um, and what we've done is created actually a customized solution to um, have a, a, a web application essentially, because the beauty about cloud is all the data is there. So you have all the raw data about your assets. So you've got, you know, the IP. And if you do a good job tagging, I can't, um, you know, stress that enough is that um, tagging is your friend. And the more that you can apply tags and governance of those tags and ensuring that you're getting the required um, data, uh, inputs into those tags um, be an asset management perspective. So, you know, right now we've got a real time view of all assets that are running in our cloud that shows us um, the instance name, the age of the instance, the owner of the instance, the IP address of the instance, uh, what version of image they're actually running. Um, and it's real time, which is awesome. So I don't, you know, need to create a point in time view. I can just go out and see what's actually stopped, what's running, what's terminated, those types of things. Um, it was very easy to make it's some basic web dev skills and a Dynamo DB, and you can, you can make pretty cool looking dashboards out of it. Um, determining scanning detection tooling across your cloud service providers, right? So really understanding what is your tool that you're using. If you're using a third party, great. Um, you can also use cloud native services, ensuring that those things are, uh, are running and um, actually scanning and detecting on a regular basis is key. Uh, testing a zero day response plan. Um, when's the last time you tested your zero day response plan? I, I, I think it's really important in this day and age as technology changes and as you understand um, the differences of um, assets in the cloud and vulnerabilities in the cloud, um, it leads to an interesting question of like, what really is a cloud asset? Is it just a compute instance? Is it a container? Is it a, 
um, a service, an AWS service? Is it a managed service? Um, those are things you're going to need to think about as you define what asset management is in the cloud. But testing your zero day response plan is, is huge, right? You really want to ensure that all the people that are involved in a zero day um, know how to respond. Again, you're not going to rely on an application team to redeploy every 30 days or 60 days if it's a zero day vulnerability, right? You really want to ensure that you know all the instances that are running it and you want to know how you're going to respond to that. And so I've got a slide a little bit later and I'll talk a little bit about more about that uh, and how, how we handle that. Uh, integrate your data into reporting tools. Um, this is this is great. The more data, uh, the more uh, security vulnerability. I say vulnerability. The more vulnerability data that you can integrate into reporting tools, the more context and more clarity you're going to be able to provide about the overall picture, right? So how are you looking at things like infrastructure vulnerabilities, application vulnerabilities? Um, you know, uh, any anything else, asset management data, reporting, all of that stuff, um, you're going to want to try and integrate that into, into a tool and, and visualize that to, to get the whole story of what's actually happening in your cloud platforms. Uh, address containers differently than EC2s? Absolutely. Um, you know, how do you patch containers? Um, when containers are rebooted, they're returned to their normal state, uh, their last known state, and uh, that patch just becomes insignificant. Right, so what you want to, if you're running containers, you're gonna, you know, likely want to have some sort of visualization of uh, runtime vulnerabilities in containers. You're gonna need to understand uh, last deployed. You're gonna understand, you know, what do you do whenever you've got uh, a bunch of vulnerabilities that are running in a container? How do you handle application side vulnerabilities versus OS side vulnerabilities? Um, I could do a whole talk on container vulnerability management, um, but I'm not gonna get into that today. Uh, patch tooling, again, you know, some of the things that we ran into is whenever, even when you're running pets in the cloud, uh, even though you take care of them like you do uh, on-prem and you patch uh, a server on-prem like you would in cloud, um, problems you run into is like we teach people to right size their instances. We say only only size the compute that you actually need and pay for what you actually need. And so they uh, create their you know EC2s or compute instances uh, with minimal disk space. And what that ha what happens there is um, patches are really bulky, and so when our patch team tries to apply, they need those that disk space actually uh, expanded, or, or sometimes they might have some some access issues uh, accessing those EC2s. Um, process map all vulnerability management processes for cloud. This was a really awesome exercise that we performed. So what we did is took an entire day and got all the teams that are involved in all of our vulnerability management processes that were related to, to cloud and had what we call like a big room planning session. And um, essentially uh, whiteboarded every process that we could think of, vulnerability lifecycle, container vulnerability management, um, uh, cloud uh, zero day vulnerability management and uh, mapped it all out and then uh, put it into a Visio uh, and then got back together after after we mapped it all out and then did a, a value stream analysis against it. So really looking for opportunities, gaps in our process, uh, places where we could create efficiencies or create automation, where there was multiple handoffs where we needed to reduce those handoffs. Um, and it gave us a, a set of a plan for us to execute against and improve our processes. And so we've already taken action on, on several of those, um, but really valuable exercise. Uh, clear communication on roles and responsibilities. I mentioned this before, having a place for folks to go and understand what uh, they should be expecting when it comes to um, you know running in the cloud. Any types of security guardrails that you have in place, any types of uh, information that you would find useful uh, for application teams to know or users to know, um, you know, make sure that's clear and available. Uh, plan for non-compliance. Uh, it happens. You know, not everybody's the greatest stewards of keeping their um, applications or instances secure. So have a plan uh, to to govern that and have a plan to implement. Um, you know, change if you need to. So I mentioned blacklist, I mentioned shutting down instances. Um, you want to be careful though, when you shut down production instances, I can't say that enough. You don't want to shut down, a, you know, a DNS server that's running in the cloud. Um, that could be really, really impactful. Um, review your vulnerability uh, reporting on a regular basis. Again, this is just understanding how well you're doing, um, looking at your reports and ensuring that um, you're meeting your, your defined SLAs. Um, so here's some thoughts around automation. 
So again, automate as much as you possibly can. That's one of the beauties of cloud and, you know, not just in vulnerability management, but there's so many other uh, mechanisms that you can create around automation uh, for, you know, running through pipelines um, and uh, applying different lambdas. So, um, or different types of, you know, serverless technology that can, um, you know, that it's event driven based on certain triggers that can fire and, um, you know, prevent you know, misconfigurations or bad things from happening. Uh, asset inventory is just uh, essentially using a, a system that can pull asset information automatically on a regular basis. I mentioned ours. It was fairly easy to create. All of the data is there, um, you know, creating a, a real-time automated dashboard um, is, has been awesome for us. Anytime somebody asks specific questions about, you know, what's running in the cloud, it can just point them there and they can generally find the information for themselves. Uh, scanning detection, uh, configuring automated scanning to run on a regular basis. Um, this is pretty easy, right? Just uh, you can use a cloud native service or a third party tool that just runs uh, daily or uh, weekly or monthly uh, or even whenever an instance spun up, right? Um, a lot of the questions we got originally around vulnerability management was what do you do with when the instances is stopped? Um, and then it spins up and then it's got all these new vulnerabilities that we didn't account for. How do we apply, uh, you know, how do we scan that and how do we ensure that we're capturing it? And so um, being able to, you know, you can do agent-based uh, scans, uh, but automating that is, is very beneficial. I mentioned the uh, golden image process. Again, just a, a, an extra gate and approval process. Uh, before images are released. It, it is a somewhat uh, manual. We're working on, on automating that, but um, you really want to ensure that if you're putting out uh, new versions of, uh, of, of images that application teams are using, that they've been reviewed by a security team with a security lens in mind. Uh, automate your deployment. So this is around just having, you know, your teams ensure that they're rehydrating their applications uh, every X amount of days per your policy and using only pristine images uh, from your repository, whether that's uh, trusted registries for containers or that's a, um, you know, service catalog or a repository for Azure instances. Like you want to ensure that they're only using uh, approved images to uh, redeploy their applications. And then uh, again, review your processes, look for those opportunities for automation and efficiencies. Uh, we've automated, um, uh, you know, a lot of our a lot of our reporting processes has has been great. And so, almost it's it's near real time. We're really close to just having um, the like um, C suite type dashboards for anybody that wants to jump in and see how well we're doing um, in real time, rather than just snapping the chalk line. Um, blacklisting is another uh, potential for automation, and that's just really allowing, not allowing images to run if they're out of compliance. Um, and so preventing them from spinning up, preventing them from um, uh, spinning up until they actually have patches applied or they're running the latest images, um, and uh, also shutting down particular instances if need be. Uh, lastly, in integrating your scanning tool outputs into a reporting mechanism. So this is really just taking uh, your outputs from your scanning tools and um, visualizing the data. Uh, you know, one of the things that we want to do also is put accountability back on our application teams and give them the ability and give the business units the ability to actually see how well they're doing from a vulnerability management posture. Um, there's so much great power there where you can... It, it's, you start to uh, pull in infrastructure vulnerability, container vulnerabilities, application vulnerabilities, um, and then give them a way that they can be measured and then they can see the risk that they're actually uh, inheriting whenever they deploy their applications. Um, the accountability goes back on them, right? Because if they're running in cattle and they're continuously deploying, um, then they're not relying on infrastructure teams to actually uh, fix their solutions. Um, they are the ones that are, you know, signing off on risk and they're the ones that, you know, need the education and need to uh, take action on remediating any risks that they uh, put out there. Uh, zero days. Again, this was a, a challenging uh, conversation uh, that we had early on, which was, okay, so what if a zero day vulnerability comes out? And uh, let's say we've got a handle on the cloud assets. We, we know which ones they are. And we've taken an approach where we've, we've patched everything. And so a couple approaches to patching, right, is like, um, do you... Um, 
do you patch everything, including your cattle? Um, do you just patch your pets? And then do you um, ask your cattle to rehydrate or redeploy? Um, what, you know, let's say, let's say you've done that and then you've reported that all the vulnerabilities have been mitigated. And then the next day or the next week, uh, the security team runs a report and they show all of a sudden that you've got a new set of, of instances that are vulnerable that have the same vulnerability, even though you thought you got all of them. Um, the reason why that happens is because the cloud assets are dynamic in nature, they do spin up and they do spin down and they do shut off. And so um, whenever they're shut off, how are you handling your zero day responses for those ones? Um, one approach is to spin everything up and then apply the patch immediately and then spin everything down. Um, that can be successful for, you know, critical, um, you know, vulnerabilities, especially ones that are, you know, internet facing. Those are, those are things that you're going to want to consider is, you know, what's the vulnerability? What is the criticality? What's the CVSS score? How are you determining where the vulnerability actually exists? Is it actually, you know, available on the internet or do you have to go through several layers of security in order to get to, to the vulnerability. Um, and so just thinking about, you know, what that criteria is for you as you develop a, a zero day response for cloud. Um, lastly, just kind of talking through just uh, cloud native services uh, that are available. Again, this is just AWS. Um, you know, we're, we're primarily AWS shop. We're also, um, you uh, have Azure as well, but um, you know, some of the, the awesome tools that they have there are just, Cloud native services are just great, right? So for asset management, you can use things like a DynamoDB um, to you know record all of the the data sets uh, into tables and um, you know report on that. You, we've got uh, various types of of lambdas that can run uh, all types of security automation. From I saw one of the talks earlier talking about you know the classic misconfiguration of of the S3 bucket, right? I mean that's an easy lambda to write that just prevents, you know, S3 buckets from being public or, you know, creating lambdas that prevent S3s, uh, unencrypted S3s, right? Um, or various types of IAM functions. Like there's all types of things you can do with lambdas. I encourage you to just experiment, innovate with them. Uh, vulnerability scanning is, you know, can be run by inspector or third party. Um, you know, uh, AWS Security Hub is great for integrating um, multiple security tools into a central location. And then using uh, something like AWS QuickSights uh, for visualization. So a very like Tableau type of a, a, a service that can uh, visualize all types of, of graphs and data out there around vulnerabilities. So um, that said, I think I'm just about done and, and just about at time. And I'll, I'll just leave you with this quote. Um, there's a way to do it better. Uh, find it by Thomas Edison. Um, as we're all in this together and we're all, um, you know, learning the intricacies of security in the cloud and um, it's, it's enormous. Um, but if, if there is, you know, solutions that you have, I, you know, encourage you to share them um, back with the community and, and I'll help us get better at this together. So. Awesome. You. Thanks, Eric. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, this is uh, so. This is Dave. I'll, I'll just jump back in here and and um, again, thank you really for uh, for a great presentation. That was number one, a lot of fun. Um, so so just so you know, I, I'm one of these uh, like configuration management, asset management nerds, mm -hmm. and we don't have enough time for me to bore you with that story. But <laughs> <laughs> I was I was encouraged actually to see some innovation going around this because I think it's still something a lot of organizations struggle pretty mightily with. Absolutely. Um, that said, we, we've, uh, yeah, we've got a couple questions, and I, I think we've got just a minute or two that we can throw these out here to folks uh, live. So the first is coming in from Chris Ferris, who is also an awesome guy who's going to be presenting tomorrow. But Chris has a lot of experience in the enterprise space doing this kind of stuff, too. And he says, uh, for your definition of cattle, is there a max age that an instance would run as opposed to how long uh, between a deploy? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, that's something we went back and forth on, actually. So we actually look at the image date um, rather than the instance age, um, because if we um, get on a cadence of deploying a image every 30 days, um, and then, you know, our expectation is that you would be running that latest image every 30 days. And if you can't, then, you know, we'll give you an additional 30 days to run, to run um, you know, 
let me explain how to explain it without being too complicated. Um, essentially, we give you 60 days, right? So the first 30 days, we release a new image. It's expected that you're running it. However, there's certain applications that cannot potentially you know, um, run that image. They might run into problems. They might need some more time. Um, and so we'll let them run, you know, N minus one version of an image for 60 days. And so we'll go with that image date and say, if you're running a instance that has an image older than 60 days, then um, you're no longer a cow. You need to be moved to a pet. And there's other criteria too as well that we set within the actual uh, cattle as well and I didn't get into, which talks about sort of like remote access, um, understanding like, should you be able to SSH, should you be able to RDP um, and those types of things that we look at. Yeah, no, I mean, attributes that, that sort of lead to risk prioritization and so forth. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, so the, the next question we have came in from Todd Thomas and um, I'm, I'm actually gonna defer this one um, sorry, Todd, just because I, I know this is a big question. I'm going to pose it to you, Eric, but I'm going to actually ask you guys to maybe take it over to the Slack channel. Um, okay. But Todd asked the question, what are the primary challenges with vulnerability management of containers? Yeah. And I just know that that could go on for a minute. <laughs> so I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm going gonna, gonna to go ahead and ask this one to, to cruise over into the uh, hallway channel for Eric, just because there's, uh, there's, there's lots of amazing things I'm sure Eric can share with that, but that's a big one. Yeah, um, sure. But I got one last one that I think um, I, I think we can probably hit really quick before I, I move over into introducing Ken and, and his talk. Okay. Um, and it comes in from Harvey Braswell. And Harvey says, hey, do you automatically network quarantine systems that are not patched or updated or meet requirements? Um, so the answer is yes. Um, we don't necessarily network quarantine them. Um, we would actually escalate to... Um, to their leaders and if we don't get any response from their leaders, which we usually do. The, the owners of the instances, we don't get responses from some of the times, but once we get to their leaders, uh, we get responses right away <laughs> on what they're doing and why they're doing uh, things the way they are. Um, but we do actually, um, you know, look at, especially when it comes to zero days, like we will shut down production instances um, just because the vulnerability is that severe and that critical and you're putting the company at risk and we've already taken steps to escalate. So we'll actually just shut it down and prevent it from spinning back up until they actually apply a new image or the patches and they you know, give them you know, 24 seven support from our cloud security team if they need anything. Awesome, yeah, I know that's, that's cool to hear. No, and great question. So, hey, thanks again, Eric, for your talk. Super, super great information. And um, yeah, if you wouldn't mind, I'm sure you've probably got a lot of eager folks <laughs> that want to pick your brain a little bit more over in Slack. Awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.